Kent will lead us in singing. Leighton will have the reading. I was pretty will have the uh, prayer. And Scott will speak to us both uh, this morning and this afternoon. Lord's table will be attended by Lance, assisted by Lucas. If he's not here, someone else can volunteer for that. And the closing prayer by Brother Steve. Uh, the rest of the announcements, uh, we'll wait till the end of the service this morning. Glad you're here. Welcome, everyone, and uh, let's begin with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day you blessed us with and, and the health and strength that we have this morning that we can come here to worship you today in spirit and in truth and to sing songs of praises to you. And bless God as he brings a lesson uh, from your word and, and bless us as hearers. And then uh, we, get, we be doers and uh, we know how to conduct ourselves as we uh, walk the pathways of this life. Thank you for your word that guides us in this life and, and uh, it uh, is able to save the souls of uh, men and women and boys and girls. We thank you for it and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
Good morning. The reading this morning will come from 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 through 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 through 14. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which is given to us in Jesus Christ before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Oh, I missed one. <coughs> 13 and 14, sorry. Hold fast the pattern of sound wards, which you have heard me from me in faith and love which are... In Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Let us pray. Our kind, our all-knowing, all-powerful Heavenly Father, we come to you before your throne thanking you for all the things that you have given us throughout of our lives. We're thankful for the small things, we're thankful for the big things, and we're, we're thankful for the things that we don't even know that we've been, uh, we've been blessed with. We pray that you would continue to bless us as you see fit, as, as it is in your plan. We pray now, Heavenly Father, for this church and the churches of this nation, the churches of this world. We pray that each and every one of them, including our church here, would be strengthened, encouraged in your word, in your love. And we pray that your love would be spread throughout this world and grown each and every day. We pray for the, the power of your gospel, and we pray that that would be the strength of, of many who will spread your love and spread your light throughout this world. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to guide us and continue to protect us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for the ones who need guidance and need need your strength. We pray that they would find you. We pray that they would seek you so that they would feel your love and be encouraged to, to spread, spread your love. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the ones who are leading us, whether it be uh, small or our, our leaders in our family, leaders in our government, we pray that they too would look for your guidance and strength and, and ask them, uh, ask you for, for your guidance and strength before others. We pray for Brother Scott and we pray that he would have a ready recollection of, of your word today. And we pray that we would apply it to our lives to, to better us as Christians. We pray for the ones less fortunate. We pray that you would 
encourage them and we pray that you would heal them we pray heavenly father that you would each and every day increase our faith and increase our love and remind us to build our life upon your promises and upon your love forgive us and save us this is our prayer in jesus christ holy name amen back with you this morning. Uh, we've enjoyed the couple of weeks of gospel meetings, uh, first with the Antioch congregation in Louisiana and then with the Mount Zion congregation in Brookhaven, Mississippi, and uh, we got rain every day in Mississippi while we were there. Some of it was pretty hard. They got uh, four inches one man did out near the church there. One, of, I think that was Monday evening when we were there. We had a little rain every day, so uh, I told them you know, whenever a preacher goes to hold a gospel meeting and it rains, you're supposed to bless your preacher a little more. He brought you rain. But they, they were thinking about taking some away because it had so much rain. They, they wanted some sunshine. But anyway, we in, enjoyed the, uh, the trip and we're thankful that the Lord has blessed us with these opportunities. Uh, today we're going to talk about this passage in 2 Timothy 8 and verse 13 in particular, I wanted to mention two things first that are mentioned by Paul in this passage. First of all, he says that we were called not according to our works, but according to his purpose and plan. And uh, that's a good thing that we're not just called according to our works, you know, what maybe we think or what we believe uh, we deserve or whatever we believe our talents might be God has called us according to his purpose and plan and so we want to be sure we're seeking that and we're fitting into what he has planned for us and we know as we'll see with the apostle Paul he was a persecutor of the church but that was not God's purpose and plan for him he was going to be a promoter of the gospel and so he has his life changed and turned around he talks about the fact that he knows whom he has believed and that he will keep what he's committed to him 
against that day. And we know in various places the scriptures assure us that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Anything we do for his kingdom will be rewarded even as small as just giving a cup of water uh, to someone. But we want to concentrate on verse 13 this morning. And uh, yeah, let's see, Travis. Maybe it went to sleep back there or else batteries have gone out on this. See if we can move it once and okay, it's working now. I guess it, it went to sleep on us. Uh, we're going to talk about according to the pattern and I want to look at several passages with you today where this word pattern or sometimes it's called plan it's other words that are used to translate it but you know, we've been studying, of course, in the Old Testament, and we know how detailed a lot of the plans were that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. You know, in Exodus 25, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings. Just so you shall make it and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. We've been studying that on Wednesdays, and we know how detailed those patterns were. Of course, we're familiar with blueprints, with the dress patterns and other patterns that we see. You know, God has always had a perfect pattern, though. From before the foundation of the world, His purpose and plan in Christ Jesus was a part of His pattern and plan. You know, if a lady makes several dresses let me see what's going on here according to this i'm good but what's happening there we go it wasn't turned up maybe okay all right let's see if we can get back into this we keep having little uh, detours this morning uh you know a lady or that makes dress patterns if she uses the same pattern it might be a different color. She might use a different fabric, but it'll be the same dress, you know, whenever she gets through with it, if she follows the pattern. A carpenter that builds a house, you know, if he builds it according to the blueprint, it's going to, he's going to be making duplicate houses. A lot of these uh, housing developments that we have in some of our suburbs here around Fayetteville, I live in one of them. Now, out there where we live, there's about three or four floor plans. That's about it. You know, they built three or four different houses, and whenever they use that particular pattern, they get that particular house. And so patterns help us to know, you know, what we're making and also how to make it. Strong's uh, 8403 is the word that's translated here, tabneeth. Uh, it's a feminine noun, and it's variously translated as pattern, plan, form, construction or figure and in the King James Version it's translated figure once, form three times, likeness five times, pattern nine times and similitude two times. In the New American Standard it's copy once, form four times, image one time, likeness five times, model two times, pattern four times and plan two times. In Numbers 8 and verse 4 now, this workmanship of the lampstand was hammered gold from its shaft to its flowers. It was hammered work according to the pattern which the Lord had uh, shown Moses, so he made the lampstand. Over in the book of 2 Kings, we read about another pattern when uh, uh, King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria. He saw an altar that was at Damascus, and King Ahaz sent to Urijah the priest the design of the altar and its pattern according to all its workmanship. And then Urijah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. And so Urijah the priest made it before King Ahaz came back from Damascus. So he had the pattern. And so he was able to make exactly what Ahaz had seen over there in Damascus before Ahaz even returned home. And of course, God wasn't happy with it. Uh, you know, we're giving clear understanding, though, in this passage of what a pattern is. Uh, the passage teaches that we can even follow patterns for false doctrines. This was a pattern for a false altar that he built there in Jerusalem. As I said, God was not happy with 
Ahaz for what he had done. And so from King Ahaz's mistakes, and not just this one, but a lot of things that he does in his life, we can find seven deadly sins that will corrupt our walk with God and our faithfulness in His church. And these include worldliness, disobedience, faithlessness, compromise, rebellion, unrepentance, and ungratefulness. All of these things were in evidence in the life of Ahaz. And, of course, God was not pleased with Ahaz. You know, David gave Solomon plans for the temple that he would build. David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat and the plans for all that he had by the Spirit. You know, this wasn't something that David made up. It wasn't something that some other man made the pattern for. Again, this pattern was given by the Spirit of God, of the courts, of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers all around, of the treasuries of the house of God, and of the treasuries for the dedicated things, also for the division of the priests and the Levites, for all the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and for all the articles of service in the house of the Lord. And again, these were very you know, precise details that were given, uh, just like the tabernacle that was built in the wilderness. And again, we see that a pattern or a plan that is strictly followed in the building of the temple that Solomon makes. And not only is the pattern given for the structure, but the pattern is also given for the priest and for those that would minister there, their service. The kind of courses and the way that they would serve was also part of the pattern. And so David encourages Solomon to lead the people according to God's laws, and he gave him God's instruction, you know, for how the temple was to be built. Over in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel has a vision, and it's through several chapters there, up through chapter 48. But in 43, he said, Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangement, its exits and its entrances, its entire design, and all its ordinances, all its forms and all its laws. Write it down in their sight, so that they may keep its whole design and all its ordinances, and perform them. And so. He was seeing a vision. This is after they had been carried away into captivity. And so, you know, he said, This is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountaintops is most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. And so in chapters 40 through 48, Ezekiel sees the future restoration of the children of Israel when they come back from captivity. And he's given the pattern for rebuilding the temple there in Jerusalem when the Jews return. And he describes not only the building of the temple, but also the spirit of those who will worship in the temple. And the pattern of true worship is to be restored. He said, let them look at the pattern and, and think about their iniquities. You know, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the temple had symbolic meanings for the people of God, both in those times and in our times today, and as we'll see again in, in a minute in the book of Hebrews, there was a reason that all these details were given, because they were going to be a pattern for the true temple that was in heaven. You know, Jesus came to save sinners, we're told in 1 Timothy 1. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. This is the Apostle Paul, who had formerly been Saul, a persecutor of the church. And he says, as one translation may say, I am the worst of sinners. You know, sometimes the devil tries to make us think that what we've done or what we may be is so terrible that God can never forgive it. And uh, He'll try to dissuade us from obedience to the Lord in that fashion by just saying, you know, you, you're just so bad, there's no redemption for you. 
Paul says that he was a pattern. He was the worst of sinners. He had persecuted the church. And so God was using him as a pattern to show future people about God's mercy and grace. You know, this pattern refers to the life of the Apostle Paul. He was the worst of sinners, but he obtained mercy. And so this pattern generates hope for all sinners who believe in Jesus and who give their lives to Him for all time. He continues to stand as a pattern for us. And notice the change that took place when Saul became Paul. And I think a similar change should take place in the lives of all of us. You know, we may be going one direction, but when we submit to the Lord and we obey Him and we begin to follow His pattern, for our life. And again, as we read earlier in this passage, we were not called according to our works, but we were called according to His purpose and plan. And so, Paul was, or Saul wasn't called according to his works at that time and what he was in Judaism, but rather he was called according to God's purpose. And that purpose was that he was going to be the messenger to the Gentile world. He was going to begin to proclaim the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. And so God desires that all sinners be saved, though. We read in 1 Timothy uh, 2 and verse 4, he, he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And again, sometimes Satan will try to convince us that this is not truth. You know, kind of like in the Garden of Eden when... Uh, the devil tempted Eve. He said, has God said you can eat of all the tree? Well, we can eat of all the trees but one, the one in the midst of the garden, we're not to eat of it. The day we eat of it, we'll die. Remember what he said? You won't die. What Satan will say on this one is, you can't be saved. God doesn't want all every, every sinner to be saved. He's not willing that all should come to repentance and be saved. Satan tries to feed us these lies, but this is what the Scripture says, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. In Titus 2, verses 6 through 8, we read, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. And so this passage reminds us that we ourselves are to be examples or are to be patterns to others. We're to be an example and pattern for other people of what God can do. You know, doctrine is an important part of this pattern. And he says in our doctrine that we are to show integrity or faithfulness to the truth, reverence or a proper attitude of submission to the truth, incorruptibility or adherence to the truth, and not allowing the truth to be watered down or corrupted. A lot of people today even say unashamedly, well, we have to adapt to our culture. And whatever our culture dictates and whatever our culture wants, then we have to change our uh, doctrines around so that we'll fit into our culture, not according to what we just read. You know, he encouraged Titus in doctrine to keep it pure, not to be corrupted. And uh, not only the doctrine of, let's say, the liturgy of, liturgy of the church, but also the doctrine of personal integrity. You know, the witness of our lives is to complement the things that we teach. And in fact, if it doesn't, no matter what we teach, if our lives do not are not congruent with that, it doesn't line up, you know, people will believe what they see and not what they hear. That, that's always the case. You know, a, a picture, you know, is worth a thousand words, one proverb says. And that's so true. People watch what we do and they may listen to some things we say, but if what we say doesn't line up with what we do, they'll go by what we do. And so our lives should honor God, and as much as possible, 
And notice I put as much as possible. Bring no shame to him or his church. We're all human and we all err. We make mistakes. And God has made provision for that. He knows that we're human. He knows that we're just dust, as the poet in Psalms says. And so he's made provision for that. But it should be our aim to live in such a way that we will bring honor to him and to his church. Well, in Hebrews 8, verses 1 through 6, the Hebrew writer said, Now this is the main point of the things we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. And so, you know, when we go back and we look at the tabernacle and the details that were given there and the pattern, then we look at the temple and the pattern that was given there and even the rebuilding of the temple when they came back from bondage, again, a pattern that was given to them. Why all these details? Why all these patterns? Because they were just a shadow, you see, of the heavenly things. They were a picture of what God has purposed and what He's planned and what He's doing through the ages. And that's why it was necessary that they stay close to the pattern. Now, you know, the Old or the First Covenant and the New Covenant, the New Testament, the Old Testament. And, of course, in the Old Covenant, it was by the righteousness of the law. And, of course, the law, as we learn in the Scripture, was given to show man that he was exceedingly sinful. We couldn't keep the law. And so all the law could ever do was condemn us because we couldn't keep it. So righteousness in Christ comes by faith, and it's through faith that we're reconciled to God. It's by the sacrifice of Christ who took our place. He is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. One of the pictures of Him in the Old Testament in Genesis 2, remember, it's when Abraham went to offer Isaac, and when he was about to take his life, there was a ram caught in the thicket, and he was told to stop. He was to take the ram off, put it on the altar, and take his son Isaac off. And that's exactly what Christ did for us. And so this is, you know, the pattern that we have in Scripture. And uh, the new covenant is, of course, the covenant of righteousness by faith in Christ. So the question is, you know, have we followed the pattern? You know, the pattern found in the New Testament helps us to understand how we become a Christian, how we live the Christian life. These patterns are all there. The instruction is there. And we are to be buried with Christ in baptism for the remission of past sins, and we are then to rise to walk in newness of life. In fact, he says in Romans 6 that the old man of sin is crucified with him that we might henceforth not serve sin, but we're to rise to walk in newness of life, following and walking after uh, His Spirit. And so we're to conform our lives to the pattern that Jesus and the apostles give us in the Word. You know, Jesus Himself is our example in so many things. The apostles continued to teach and further instruct the church on the things that God wants and the pattern that we're to follow. And so the question is, you know, have you followed the pattern? Have you been baptized for the mission of your sins? And if you've been baptized, are you growing in the grace of the Lord? Are you really making an effort to do that? You know, the divine measurements truly do matter. 
You know, Noah obtained God's grace, we read in Genesis 6 and verse 8. But we also read there, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. He was saved by grace through faith, but he built an ark, and he built it according to specific instructions that God had given him. He was given a pattern. He was told exactly what to build and how to build it. But he was saved by grace through faith. But you see, this is by divine measurement. Israel obtained God's presence, we read through the book of Exodus, by the fact that they built this tabernacle according to God's pattern. And this was a place where God said He would meet with them and where the priests came and offered their sacrifices. Israel's sacrifices were acceptable to God, as we read in 2 Chronicles. And then the holiness of God's people is secured, according to Ezekiel 42, 20 and 43, 10 through 12. And as we said, he was talking about the future, and he was looking not just toward the temple that they would rebuild the physical temple, but actually the pattern of life, you know, that they were to follow, what God's people were supposed to be. And so, you know, the question is, how do we measure up in God's sight? Have we obeyed the gospel? And if so, are we, you know, striving daily to grow in the grace and knowledge of God? Are we walking after the Spirit? Are we allowing Him to direct us? Because God, as Paul said here, didn't call us according to our works. In other words, according to our plans, according to our purpose, according to what we think, but He saved us according to His purpose and His plan. And He has a pattern for our lives. And uh, the question is, are we willing to submit to that pattern? Are we looking for God's pattern and trying to uh, fashion our lives after the pattern that God has given us? I pray that uh, these thoughts will prompt you to further study. Uh, of the Word of God and be sure that you are following the pattern that He has for your life. If you are in need of our prayers or have any way we can assist you today, we've selected the song of invitation and we invite you to come while we sing.
shock whisper wherever thou art. From this dark world you would draw thee apart, speaking so tenderly, give me thy Acts 20 and 7 talks about the disciples coming together to, to break bread, and this is when Paul comes and speaks until midnight. So that's why we're here the first day of this week, and the first day of every week, is to break bread with one another. You know, I know we've probably all heard it said, well, if you do it every week, I mean, doesn't it lose its importance? Isn't it boring if, to go in there and do it every week? Isn't it hard to focus every single week on the same thing? We know every single week that we come here, we sing. Every single week we pray. Every single week we have a sermon. We're doing all the same things. If you really think about it, that's, it's an inner problem for these people. It's an inner problem for these people that think that they have to do something to dress up the Lord's Supper. You know, you see candles lit, you see music in the background, you, different things that you hear and you see when people are taking communion, that's an inner problem. And it's something that everyone should think about. You know, on, on the eve that Jesus' enemies came and took him, that was the day that he broke bread with his disciples. And he told them, look, this is the bread of life. This is my body that I'm sacrificing for you. 
And what does he say at the end of that? He says, every time you partake of this bread, remember that. God knows we're forgetful people. To me, it would be harder to do this once a quarter, once a month, once a year. It's so much easier to be reminded every week. And then God took the cup and he said, take it and drink it. This is my blood that I spill for you to save you from your sins. What else does he say? Every time you partake of this, remember me. So this is what we do every Sunday. And I hope we all realize that there's reasons that we do this. It's in the Bible. And if you're ever questioned about it, that's the answer to it. That's, what, that's the way we're told to do it. Look in Acts, first day of the week when the disciples met to break bread. Look in Corinthians that talks about the crucifixion of Jesus. So as we come around this table this morning, let's remember what Jesus said when he instituted this. And let's remember his body that he gave to save us as we partake of the bread this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning to thank you for all the many blessings that you bestow upon us. Father, we thank you for this church that meets here. We thank you for the privilege that we have to come here to study from your word and to uh, be with other Christians. And, and, and we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy to be able to do that this morning. We especially thank you, Father, for this time that's set aside to partake of this bread that, that represents our Savior's body. And, Father, we pray that as we partake of this, we may do so in a well-pleasing manner to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we'd like to continue our thanks for these many blessings. Father, we ask that you please bless this cup that represents Christ's shed blood on the cross. Allow us to take it in a manner that's well pleasing in your sight. We ask these favors in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
that concludes the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 says, To lay up and store upon the first day of the week. Jesus tells us to take our money and set it aside to give back to the church. And he says to give as, your pros as you prosper. I can't afford to give as I prospered. I mean, I, I've, I've been blessed so much. But we need to get to the point to where it's a sacrifice. It's not something that's just left over that you can, you can give. So let's remember that that's also part of what Jesus has instructed us to do as we give back this morning. Gene, would you give thanks for our giver blessings? Amen. Well, that concludes our worship service this morning. I don't have a bulletin, so I don't have a lot of uh, announcements to, to make. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we probably do remember uh, several of those that were asking for our prayers, those that are impaired in either body, mind, or spirit. And remember them. Uh, there is a gospel meeting beginning today at White House. Uh, through August the 1st with Randall Castleman. The theme is eight words that lead to salvation. And it'll be Sunday through Thursday in the evening at 7 p.m. It says a community event held annually since in July since 1840. That's a long time. Remember uh, the service of the church this afternoon at uh, 1.30. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, uh, continue our study in Exodus. We're getting close to completing the book of Exodus, and I'm sure we'll have another good study lined up for then. A preacher was asked to come home with the family for Sunday dinner. So... While the man and the lady at the house were getting things prepared, the little boy was entertaining the preacher. The preacher said, son, said, what are we having for lunch today? He said, goat. He said, how do you know you're having goat? He said, because I heard mom and dad talking. Today it'd be just as good as any to have the old goat for dinner. <laughs> well, that's all I have. If you'll stand, we will be dismissed by Brother Steve. Holy Father, we're so grateful to you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We ask you now to be with us as we go out into the world and help us to act like Christians, Heavenly Father. Help us to show it by the way we live and the way we talk and by all means possible so that we might have the greatest influence upon the lives of others. Be with us each day. Walk with us and guide us and then let us live with you forever.